Hey guys, Jonathan Feist here for Drone Rush. I'm about to do something I'm always excited to do. Sit down with Brendan Schulman, VP of Policy from DJI. We're going to talk about drone laws. Let's do it. Hello again, Brendan. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here. Uh, how is the world of drones going for you? <laughs> it's great. It's very busy. You know, uh, yeah. uh, as was true when we last spoke, uh, I think a couple years ago, there's always uh, an interesting drone policy issue to work on, you know, to help uh, build the regulations that will allow people to fly responsibly, but also to have the freedom that they enjoy to use drones for fun purposes and also for business and public safety. Certainly. And uh, since we spoke last, uh, DJI has rolled out, uh, for example, a quiz that um, you know pilots have to take or could take for yes. a short time prior to piloting their DJI aircraft. Or, um, what was the whole mindset behind that? Well, we um, look. We, we think it's really important that people understand and know the rules of safe operation. And uh, you know, in talking to regulators around the world, including, for example, in New Zealand, uh, there are surveys about what is your biggest concern about drones. And the top result is always that people don't know or understand what the rules are. And I really do believe when people know what the rules are, they almost everyone wants to follow them and be safe and responsible. Uh, so what we did is we developed our own what we call knowledge quiz. Um, which is required to operate the product. Uh, but I think it's pretty uh, easy and straightforward and, and it's stuff that you should know and it's multiple choice. You can take it as many times as you want. So once you pass a sort of handful of questions, uh, you're off and running. So the idea there was to uh, make sure people understand and know basic principles like keeping within the visual line of sight. Uh, now in the legislation that passed in October, Congress has directed the FAA to develop an online or an electronic knowledge test uh, for recreational users. So that's actually in line with uh, what we've already done. And hopefully the, te the official test that the FAA will come up with will probably be a little different, uh, but hopefully we'll have the same principle. You know, let let's teach people what they need to know in terms of safe operation, but then let them go have fun. Do you anticipate any troubles or contradictions between what you at DJI have done and what the FAA may be rolling out? No, no, we're not, we're not gonna conflict or contradict. And in fact, once that official test is in place, uh, we probably won't need our knowledge test in the United States anymore, but we have rolled it out in, in Germany, Australia, and the UK. Uh, so we've done we've done it around the world, and you know if we see it, that there's an official test, uh, we're not going to need to do our own flavor of that. And it's quite possible, depending on which direction the FAA goes, that the official test could be uh, built into DJI's software at some point. I will have to see how the FAA uh, moves forward in terms of actually developing that electronic testing. Uh, but it could be that that test will be conveniently with inside the DJI software as well. Gotcha. And for any new pilots picking up a drone for the first time, maybe they just got it for Christmas, oh, do you have any words of wisdom for them before they haul off into the backyard? Well, obviously, fly safely and responsibly. Uh, and I think it's really important just to kind of like be a good neighbor and, and be sort of thoughtful. You know, sometimes we hear about people being bothered by drones in parks or beaches. And, you know, I, I think that we don't want to see regulations develop where we don't need them. And sometimes it's very hard to create a rule that says, well, don't fly here because a lot of people are bothered by it. I think what you want to do is, look, if you, you're an ambassador of the technology wherever you use it. So if you can wait a few minutes and fly when it's less crowded somewhere, that's probably a better idea. Just kind of be thoughtful and considerate, uh, just like you would with any other technology. You know, we're across from this very noisy booth here. And you know, sometimes you want to ask people to turn down the volume. and. I just think being thoughtful and a good neighbor is a good policy. So uh, you guys at DJI, you of course, just or launched the new Mavic 2 Enterprise. It has great things such as uh, encryption for your data storage, another, for example, a beacon accessory that goes on top to help with your night flights. Uh, is there anything else you guys anticipate and accessories possibly coming out, or just any changes coming from the FAA that you think will change how your drones are operated by the users? Yeah, actually I think there are a number of things coming probably in the next year or two that will make a difference to commercial operations. Uh, some of those uh, are arguably reflected in the Mavic 2. We have that strobe light. Uh, that's The spec on that is three miles, which hap not coincidentally matches the FAA spec for a night waiver. Uh, there's like a thousand or two thousand of those out there right now. At some point there'll be a rule, uh, probably proposed in the next uh, several weeks or months, uh, for night operations, which will probably be very similar, I would guess, I don't know, to uh, the waivers that are out there, and will involve that, that visible light, uh, and also for flight over people, because a lot, you know, a lot of, you know, currently under Part 107, 
flight over people is prohibited for safety reasons. Uh, but the FAA knows that a lot of people want to do that, particularly in um, news gathering, public safety, search and rescue, firefighting. It's very useful. So um, the way to do that is to just protect people on the ground from being hurt if the drone malfunctions or falls. Uh, so one way to do that is a parachute. Uh, there's a parachute standard that came out of ASTM. We were involved in helping develop that. There's now at least one company called Indemnis that is, has its uh, parachute now tested to meet that standard uh, using our drones. Uh, that's news we actually released today. Released this morning, yes. Yeah, yeah. so that's sort of news. Is that, that's kind of, and that's an anticipation of the FAA not just doing waivers for flight over people, but getting to the point where it's part of the rules beyond Part 107. Uh, so I think we look forward to that. Um, you know, other things are on the more distant horizon, beyond visual line of sight operations um, will be there as well. And obviously a key initiative that um, will be important for doing all these things is remote ID. And I don't know if that's a topic you're interested in as well, but that's sort of a big piece of what FAA is going to be working on over the next year or so. Certainly. Has the FAA d discussed your aeroscope system at all with you in terms of implementing that on a larger scale, or is aeroscope still your in-house project? <laughs> Well, uh, we've certainly uh, given them information about it. Uh, you know, the idea behind Aeroscope was we, we agree that providing an, an ID mechanism similar to the license plate really does solve some of these safety and security issues that have been in the news lately, uh, and not just lately, but obviously the Gatwick situation, so, uh, uh, whatever it was that, would, would be assisted by having at least some kind of remote ID solution, if only to exclude some possibilities of what's going on. So uh, FAA is aware of Aeroscope and you know, we've given them information about it. Uh, I think the direction will be something that's a little bit more uh, standardized. So think, think more like a Wi-Fi solution where you could use your existing phone uh, to receive the ID signal from a drone. Now it may not have quite the same uh, characteristics as Aeroscope, but that would be a similar kind of mechanism where you're sending your ID information to the area near where the drone is flying. Uh, which we think is a much better solution than forcing the drones to all connect to a giant database of information about where people are flying and then having law enforcement and others access that. Because that, that repository is going to have competitively sensitive information about where, you know, if you're, you have a drone business and your competitor uh, is flying and, and you have the ability to kind of like figure out what they're doing, you can, you know, get intelligence on their information. So we think something that's more localized is probably the best solution for most operations out there today. Uh, and it'll probably be something that looks like a Wi-Fi based solution. Very good. Yeah. And for those that are worried about safety and security, as you were mentioning, um, do you have any plans on systems that track the pilot in either the remote themselves, or are you just going to stick with tracking the aircraft? Uh, well, it'll track the aircraft, but I, I, it is important to figure out where the pilot is located, because I, I think that information, which, which is facilitated in Aeroscope, uh, just allows people to talk to the pilot. You know, it's sort of like if you have an issue with people doing other things, you, you can go talk to them. I mean, that should be the first step in any kind of response if someone's uh, maybe doing the wrong thing. Um, but if you can't find the pilot because the drone is here, but the pilot's like 300 feet away, what are you going to do? So, so identifying the location of the pilot is important for safety, security, and, uh, and uh, enfor uh, law enforcement uh, response. Uh, sort of independent of what, what your license plate is, is the ability to find you. And obviously if you're really causing a problem, then they might need to like ask you to land or arrest you or something. Um, so I think it is important to be able to find the pilot, uh, who's usually just standing. I don't think it's a matter of tracking. It's a location it's certainly, yes. uh, facility. And any advice for pilots who are trying to do it legit and be responsible neighbors as a pilot? Uh, do you recommend wearing a vest, putting up cones, and identify yourself as a pilot? Anything like that? Uh, you know, it's it's very specific to the situation. So you got you got to know your operating environment. So you know, if you're if you're taking if you're doing real estate photography and you're going to have to get really close to the neighbors' homes, maybe knock on the door, drop a pamphlet. I don't know if you need to wear a vest. I know at one point FAA suggested that. It could be an interesting way to, to help. Uh, there's no right answer to that. Um, I do think, um, you know, if you're in the middle of nowhere, you don't need to wear a vest. Um, if you're in a, you know, if you're near the airport, if you're in a sensitive location, you might need to take other, other steps. Um, you can just have to kind of, you know, it's like anything else, be a little bit uh, courteous about what you're doing. And it's also important if you if you have a business and you're operating in a in a city often. Uh, look, I think it's really important to get out there. Meet your city council members, meet your mayor, invite them to your to your workshop or your 
studio or your hangar, whatever you would call it, and say, hey, I've got this, this great drone business here right in this hometown. Um, I want you to know drones are being used in the city for all kinds of productive purposes, whether they're public safety or commercial or volunteer, environmental, just fun, artistic. And to socialize the technology, because you know the huge challenge we have is driven by a lack of awareness and information uh, by the policymakers as to what drones are and what they're doing. So very important if you really do care about trying to uh, create a better environment for drones, particularly when we have these awful headlines virtually every week, Certainly. get out there and talk to the people who are in charge of your local policies and show them what you're doing so that they have some positive frame of reference so when they pick up the paper, they aren't only reading about airports getting shut down. Because that's like the rare case, right? Very true. If it's even yes. a drone, uh, which we don't know. But that, that, whatever it is, it's, that should be the rare situation. And the more common situation, we know there's a million uh, users out there flying drones that are registered with the FAA. There's over 100,000 Part 107 pilots. A lot of great stuff is happening every day with drones. We need people to understand and know about that. Is there anything you, DJI is doing, or do you have any advice for pilots to be safe and make sure that they're following the rules. Be safe and follow the rules. I, I, <laughs> no, I think, look, part, part 107 is the result of a lot of industry advocacy to make the rules reasonable, make that test reasonable. 91% of people who take that test pass it on the first time. That's great. There's really no excuse not to do all the things you should do. Uh, controlled airspace, Lance is automated in many locations so you can get approval to fly there. Um, what's the reason not to follow the rules? I, I, it's really important, you know, we're sort of on your side as advocates uh, to help ensure that the rules of operation are reasonable and allow you to do the things that you want to do. And if people then don't follow the rules, it sort of undermines our credibility when we go to the government and say, look, make the rules reasonable and people will follow them. Because here we have reasonable rules and if people aren't following them, then maybe the rules don't need to be reasonable. So we've done this around the country. The Canadian rules just came out. That's two years of work by me and my team with Transport Canada to explain to them the technology. They started in a really bad place two years ago with that emergency order, which basically banned drones in most Certainly. locations in Canada near populated areas. And we worked with them and other stakeholders in Canada over a period of two years to make that much more reasonable. And the result announced today is terrific. And uh, what's the reason not to follow the rules? And if, and if there's a rule that's, that's bothering you that doesn't make sense, let me know, because there may be uh, opportunities in the future to change it. But uh, if you're, you know, the best thing is to get engaged in that uh, process. If you are concerned or worried about the rules, as I think we all should be, uh, write to your representatives, file comments. When, when this flight over people, a night operational NPRM, the proposed rule comes out, uh, probably in the next few weeks or months. And when remote ID rules come out, if that's of concern to you, maybe you're worried about cost or privacy or something else, technology retrofitting. How are you going to make all of your your whole fleet compliant? file comments with the FAA, like be involved. It's hard, you know, if you are going to complain or disobey when you haven't been engaged during this incredible opportunity to have input into the government process, I, I think you've lost a, a huge opportunity and then you're on the wrong side of it. So I, I would say get engaged now when you can as these things are being developed. Look, have fun, be safe, and um, look, we, we are working every day. We've got a team of, uh, at this point, nine professionals around the world. Uh, in, in many countries, Europe, uh, Australia, Japan, the United States, Canada, Mexico, uh, we're hiring Latin America to really um, be on your side and advocate for reasonable regulations. And if there's something that you, that you need or want or that's worrisome to you, there are many ways to get in touch with me. I'm uh, Drone Laws on Twitter. You can send me a message. I think I've got open uh, direct messages. So you can just send me a note that, hey, you know, I'm worried about something. Um, another good uh, way to get involved is we support a, um, the Network of Drone Enthusiasts a platform, which is short for Node, so it's at nodecampaign.org. And that is just a grassroots platform where if there's a local policy or state or county or even federal that's of concern, uh, you're sort of on the list by zip code and we can alert all the people in your area to get engaged and with one click send a message to your local representatives that you're concerned about that policy that's developing. So that's a really easy way to get involved is to join the Node campaign and then... Node works. I've used it. Have you? Yes. That's great. Which uh, town or, or uh, city? Portland, Oregon. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So uh, look, we're just... Uh, that's just you being organized to actually speak to your own representatives. It's just really a tool. 
Uh, it's, it doesn't do its own lobbying or messaging, right? So, and you can you can send whatever message you want, but we're facilitating a sort of really easy way for you to send input to your lawmakers. And I hope you'll take advantage of that because we we, we you know there's a lot of resources that are devoted to running that. Um, so that's uh, maybe my closing thought is to join the Node campaign. Uh, I think we're going to do a lot more with that in in the coming year, and hopefully everything will be great. Very good. Thank you very much once again, guys. This was Brendan Schulman, VP Policy for DJI. Thank you. Always Thank a you pleasure. So much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.